Hey, look at all that stuff you people poured into me. Mississippi. Where is he? Where is Mississippi? Who is Mississippi? Well, that's the kid, the fellow who was around with us all night. Where is he? That's what I was asking Bull. Across the street, stable. So I saw him pointing a gun after us. He ought to know better than that. Want me to go after him? Bull, you certainly ought to know better than that. This is the first time in two months I felt like doing nothing for you. And now you don't want me to do it? Was there something wrong with that, or was it just my hangover? You made better sense when you were drinking. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the diaries. Today, uh, I'm going to show you some things uh, from Kid Stuff Film. I'm going to show you some of my favorite scenes, which I think are kind of cool, and um, hopefully you will feel that way too. Also, today, um, I am going to be showing something that happened a couple of days ago when we finally had a monsoon. Oh, it was glorious. The rain, rain, rain came down, 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 filled up the water, filled it all around. So, uh, that's part of what we're going to do, and then a couple other things I'm hoping to get in there. I also have uh, a guitar lesson today, but I don't know if I'm going to show that. It was close. It was close enough. However, tomorrow... I am going to the uh, Arizona School of Dentistry to have uh, get an interview to have these things that are left over in my face put in rip out and then replaced with ones that work. You go chomp chomp chomp, and I'll be able to smile and you'll see teeth instead of this, you know, my impersonation of the entrance to the Carlsbad Caverns. So that's going to be happening. That's going to be starting happening tomorrow, and hopefully that's going to go really well. And uh, new projects coming up as far as the studio is concerned, and of course the games and all that kind of fun stuff. But right now, let's start off with uh, a little piece of information. It's time for Eddie's Weekly Grind! Yeah! This is a piece of information to the people who make beer commercials for the radio. There's something you guys have got to understand. I've noticed this for years, and I'm sure everyone else has too. But when you pour a beer, or a coffee, or a soda, or anything like that, when you pour it into a glass, this is the noise it makes. See? That's the noise it makes. The noise you hear on a commercial is one of two things. Either the guy is pouring the beer for like... And here's my cup, here we go, woo -hoo! Or, that person has already had like four or five beers, and he's taken a leak in the bathroom, because it does, it, it, the sound of beer pouring on a commercial sounds like somebody taking a piss. It does not sound like beer. Okay? Now, there's also another commercial that I heard recently where they had somebody pouring coffee. It was supposed to say, the line says, you need energy to brew your... Well, if you poured that coffee from that distance, it would splatter all over and burn everyone, and then you'd have a lawsuit. So, it's, it's, it's silly. So, guys, listen. You can't use that sound. Every time I hear that sound, I have to use the bathroom. And I'm sure a lot of other people do, too. The sound of beer, the sound of coffee pouring from 15 feet away, that's not what it sounds like. That's what something else sounds like. Okay, that's my rant for now. So here we go with other exciting... Why did I point over here? I'm going to point this way this time. Here we go! Okay, what you see here, aside from my cluttered table, here's a piece of plastic, which is going to be our one-way mirror. And I have marked off exactly how we need it to be cut. And I'm going to score it. Very 
carefully. Trying to be as straight as possible, which is not easy to do with this plastic. Okay. And score it this way. Now we know the score. <laughs> Ta-da! Well, I am all tired out after that one. And try to work the little bumps and ridges out of it. So it's a little bit smoother than that, because it's kind of bumpy there. Okay, now some mysterious light coming up. It's because I have a desk light down here. I've been working with the endless hall, putting that shiny plast uh, you know, the shiny one-way um, film on the plastic. Wasn't that cool? And this is what it looks like with the light shining on it. And uh, as you can see, yeah, it looks like a box. Now the light is shining inside of the box. Now the question is, did this film work on it? Well, you tell me. Let's see if I can move that light around a bit so it's not quite... Yes, it worked quite nicely. So when I put the proper lighting in here, hello, there I am. When I put the proper lighting in here, it's going to look pretty darn cool. So here we are so far. Well, it's about nine o'clock in the morning, something like that. Let me say, <coughs> yeah, it's nine o'clock in the morning, and uh, we're not exactly out on the Adventureland porch, but we're just inside the door here. Because as you can see, there's some moisture going on here. Because our old friend the monsoon has arrived. And it took a long time to get here. Well, we've come to the time of the show that I want to show you some of my favorite scenes from a couple of, uh, or a few, uh, from four different, uh, kid stuff films. There's a lot of scenes that I really like, and it's 
kind of difficult to pick any particular, but these four I thought I would uh, give you for this time, and maybe I'll give you some more different ones next time. The first one is from Alex and the Curse of Creep. Um, this is the story of Alex who uh, got pulled into a book at one point in time, and he went to rescue his brother who had been pulled into the book before, and that was um, the original story. And then in the sequel, Alex's brother is hurt by a demon curse, and he goes back into the book to try to uh, find out what happened and to save his brother again. In this scene, Alex and Stephen, who are traveling together, have met up with Rothgar and Vandor, who are both characters from the book, and Beetle, who is a seven-year-old necromancer. And they meet up with an oracle who has information for Alex and for Stephen. And um, Beetle kind of intervenes in the middle. So here, here's the scene. It's, it's pretty cute. Well, Rothgar here to pay up. Not quite yet. We have a small problem. I know, but I'm only assuming there is a problem. I am Beetle. I don't believe we will. You're an necromancer. You guys really don't care who you're saying with you. That's not very nice, you know. He saved my life. That? Is it harm him or is it just you? I see Lord Creep has caused harm to your brother, and yours as well. Some of my favorite scenes aren't necessarily, you know, funny or like that, but really, really show how my cast has grown and matured as actors. And this scene that you're going to see is, uh, there's actually two scenes. One is, they're from the same movie, um, it's from Dreamwalkers to The Endless Midnight. One scene, we meet up with Jesse and uh, Tamara and discover that they had a very volatile relationship. And Gordon is with them also. Uh, these are the three of the four people who wound up having to deal with the uh, shadow world of dreams and uh, uh, had a battle with uh, Thrak, who was the main villain. But in this scene, Thrak has come back and uh, Jesse and Tamara, who apparently were boyfriend and girlfriend for a short period of time, uh, have to get together to work together again and it doesn't go so well from the beginning then the next scene is another one where they're starting to get kind of fumed at each other because Jesse's getting frustrated with the fact that he can't find his sword but the story kind of turns a little bit so here's that scene or those scenes so the question is why does he have to go through the trouble of killing us first if all he has to do is destroy Jesse and enter the realm? Most likely to demoralize him by taking away the people that care about him the most. Not that I care about you anymore, of course. Yes, Tamara, I know. Because there's nothing to care about. It was just after all that happened, the monsters and demons and Thrak, and I don't like you. Tamara, calm down. This is about Thrak trying to kill us again. Don't make a big deal out of it. Thrak killing us isn't a big deal. He means a big deal about us. Jesse McGregor, there is no us. There's just you and me stuck in another dire circumstance that I had nothing to do with outside the fact that I know you. Tamara, jeez, I can't believe you. Thrak is trying to kill us again. All you're caring about is a stupid, meaningless little relationship. Meaningless? Who are you to say what's meaningless, Gordon? Tamara! Enough! For crying out loud, we are in danger here. Can we concentrate on that for a moment, please? Just so you know, Jesse, once this is over, I'm out of here. Either way you look at it, I still don't know where it is. It's right in front of your face. I know that. It's in front of my face. Look! See? It's right there! Don't be sarcastic with me, Jesse. You need to figure this out. I thought you were the brains of this outfit. Hey! I didn't ask for this any more than you did, Jesse McGregor. Just because I know what needs to be done bloody well doesn't mean I know how to do it. You need to figure out how it is right in front of your stupid face. Right now, the only thing in front of my stupid face is... You. Oh, you don't get to see more of that. Hey. Um, this next one is <laughs> kind of a strange and silly scene from Zeus Vax. Zeus Vax was kind of a um, steampunk story. Has uh, two boys from normal reality who get pulled into this alternate reality by Everett Beckerley uh, into a world where gasoline was never created. So everything runs on steam, consequently. 
the Jules Verne type of steam feeling is in this. In this scene, our two heroes have made it to the gate of the bringer, which is where they are trying to get to because they have to take care of this task so they can get sent back home. But when they get to the gate, they find a gatekeeper, and the gatekeeper is this little robotic dude at the top of the gate, and he makes getting into the into the uh, bringer's territory a little bit complicated and confusing. So check that one out. Help me find the keyhole. There is no keyhole. What? Did you just say that? Did I just say what? That there's no keyhole. I know there's no keyhole. I just said that. Just for once, can we meet someone normal? Yeah, I'd like to that. We were sent by Everett Beckerly to deliver the device to the bringer. Um, hello? Why are you saying hello? We've already met. You didn't say anything to Brett. Was I supposed to? Do you understand what I said? Of course. You've been sent by Everett Beggarly to deliver the device to the bringer. Yeah. Yeah? So? So what? Oh, brother. What do we do? No need to raise your vocals. If you need information, why didn't you ask? I did! No, you didn't. You made a statement. You didn't ask a question. Look, can you just tell us what we're supposed to do? Well, how would I know? I just look after the gate. I didn't send you on this mission. We're getting over here. Well, you certainly won't if you don't unlock the gate. Can't you open it? No. Then what do you do here? I look after the gate. Keywords. Look after. I don't open it, close it, clean it, oil it, maintain it, or unlock it. So basically, you're here for no reason? Everything has a reason. For instance, do you know how to unlock the gate? With the key, I would guess. Ah, that is what you use, but do you know how to work the keys? He says there's no keyhole. Well, if there's no keyhole, then how do we use the keys? Well, there you have it. I'm here to tell you how to use the keys. Or not, if I so choose. We need to get in to deliver the device to the bringer. Well, fortunately for you, the bringer's expecting someone, and I'm assuming it's you. So this is how you use the keys. First, bring them out. Now, both of you take hold of it. Why does everything we use have to hurt? I would assume that's a rhetorical question. You'll probably want to be on your way now. Let's just get this over with. I've had enough as I can stand. <sighs> this last one I'm going to show you is from uh, our newest film, Weeble Fester Fur. And this is the scene when the Weeble Slayer is brought into our world so he can battle the Weevil Fester, and the Weevil Slayer turns out to be a boy. And so um, we have the mad scientist and Igor. Igor is completely flummoxed because uh, the Weevil Fester eats kids, so how can the Weevil Slayer be a kid? But in this particular scene, we find out that in the Weevil Slayer's reality, the mad scientist and Igor both exist, but how they are, what they are, and who they are is a totally different matter. So, check this one out. Excellent. Well, I am... I know who you are. You exist in my reality as well. Really? It's kind of exciting, actually. What am I like in your reality? Um, for one thing, you're a woman. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so you mean in your reality I'm a... Not so funny anymore, is it, Rover? Well, it's not important anyway, so to our task. I mean, that's what you would say anyway. I know that's what I would say, so I was a little surprised to hear you say it. Well, I've been sitting out here for quite a little bit now. It's been one continuous form of thunder. And the strangest array of umbrellas for the past. So I'm just going to sit here for a while and enjoy this monsoon. And I think it rains time down a little bit. I'm getting here from the fishes that I'm running so I'm just going to fly with you. So uh, next time we'll have uh, more stuff for you. I hope you enjoy it. We'll see what happens next week. In the meantime, you guys have yourself a great week. End of life.